My name is Megan Showalter. I'm a Hillsdale College junior majoring politics and classical studies. I'm currently interning with the Laura Ingram Show as part of the Washington Hillsdale Internship Program. Larry P. Arn is the 12th president of Hillsdale College. He received his BA in 1974 from Arkansas State University, graduating with the highest distinction. He received his MA in government in 1976 and his PhD in government in 1985 from the Claremont Graduate School. He also studied in England from 1977 to 1980, first as a research student in international history at the London School of Economics, and then in modern history at Oxford University. While in England, he also served as director of research for Sir Martin Gilbert, the official biographer of Winston Churchill. From 1985 to 2000, he served as president of the Claremont Institute. While at Claremont, he was the founding chairman of the California Civil Rights Initiative, which was passed by California voters in 1996 and prohibited racial preferences in state hiring, contracting, and admissions. Dr. Arn is on the board of directors of the Heritage Foundation, the, he the Henry Salvatore Center of Claremont McKenna College, and the Claremont Institute. Dr. Arn is currently heading the Hillsdale College's Founders Campaign for Capital and Endowment Goals that will expand the school's buildings and grounds, strengthen its liberal arts programs, and establish the Hillsdale Graduate School of Statesmanship. Dr. Arn is also a professor of politi politics and history at Hillsdale where he teaches courses in Aristotle, Winston Churchill, and the American Constitution. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Larry Arn, who is speaking on the topic, How Our Economic Liberty Can Be Restored. Thank you, Megan. I thought uh, Paul Marino did a splendid job in his remarks, and I thought Brittany Baldwin did a better job introducing him. So I'm going to try to be as approximately as good as uh, Megan, as Paul achieved with Brittany, and then I'll be okay. <laughs> thank you for watching. Those of you who are watching, and thank all of you for being here. I see my old friend Michael Pack in the audience. I'm seeing well. How you doing, Michael? But, um, so uh, thank you, David Bob, too, I, and the staff here at the Kirby Center. They work really hard, and uh, it's always a joy to come here. And I don't, I, I, I'm in the college business, so I come here three days a month, and it keeps me from being ruined by the city. <laughs> But uh, they seem to be relatively immune so far. Good guys. Uh, I'm supposed to tell you how to restore our economic freedom, and I'm going to do that by two techniques. I'm going to uh, make you more frightened, and then urgent uh, understanding will lead to some improvement, I hope. And then the second thing is I'm going to tell one little quick story about how such a thing was done one time, because I happen to have observed it and paid little attention to it. Um, the, the frightening part. Uh, depends on an understanding from the founding that will help make sense of what's going on today. And some of the things I've, I'm going to explain, I'll explain them quickly because they've been well explained by Paul and by Congressman Pence, too, to whom I give my greetings. Um, you know, economics is a word that's uh, almost never mentioned in the American Revolution. It, it comes up a few times, but it's not really quite what they talk about. They do talk about it in one very grand place, and I'll mention that place. It's uh, really grand. Uh, in the first inaugural of George Washington, he says that uh, our republic is founded, I'm talking from memory, but it's close to this, in the great fact in the whole course and economy of nature, the indissoluble union between virtue and happiness. You've got to be good to be happy. And the republic, he goes on to say, has got to be good to be prosperous and free. That word economy there, right, that means the general working of things. And I'll tell you how that word comes up, because it's a really neat word. The word economy comes from two Greek words. One of them is oikos, which means house. And the other is nomos, which means law. And so economics means the law of the house, the law of household management. The first book of economics is written by Xenophon. It's a dialogue. It's called the Oikonomicus, and it's about household management. It's actually more philosophic than that. Uh, the joke in the middle of that book happens to be that the man talks on and on about how his wife does everything he says, and uh, his interlocutor keeps proving that his wife is probably a lot smarter than he is, and he's really doing what she says, <laughs> a phenomenon well known in the Arn household. So you can see if it's the law that, of the way a house is run, it could be a law of the way everything is run, in the way George Washington uses that word. Economics is both local and tight and grand and cosmic even. 
And economics in America, as we use the term today, that's dominated when they talk about it in the American Revolution by another expression, and that expression is property rights. You can't read anything in the American Revolution without running into that word, that term. It's everywhere. And the reason it's everywhere is that it combines two things, and the two things describe the whole human being, body and soul. The first one is uh, the material goods we own, the stuff we have. And that stuff we have is very important to us. And the reason is, if I were to go too long, I won't because somebody will jerk the microphone out of the way from me, but if I were and, we, and I talked on for an hour or two, everybody get really tired. And there's some Hillsdale College students here and you guys are probably like them. They will listen politely till the last trump soundeth. But their bodies would soon weaken on the other hand too. You can't do it all day long. You gotta have a drink and you gotta eat something and you gotta sleep every day and you'll die if you don't do it. And that means that you gotta work. And that means that uh, the work that you have to do, you're entitled to the fruit of it. It is your subsistence. And your material property comes from that. And remember about human beings that there's this weird thing about them that they, like everything I just explained to you, we're the only beings on earth that can know that, all that stuff. But on the other hand, we still live just like the animals in that respect. And although we have reached a state in society where we store up a lot extra, on the other hand, every time the economy turns down or every time somebody's habits get bad and they don't work or every time somebody has a terrible misfortune, they suffer and they suffer economically and their problems. So it is our business as human beings to go about the business of solving that problem and we have to do that all the time and we do do it all the time. And so you have a right to it because by the way, you know, it would be easier. Like our college, um, it's expensive to run a college. These kids, they have, you know, every time we have 10 students, we have one teacher. And these kids have to live and they have to eat and their parents have to help support them and the college has to help support them and its friends have to help support it. And it would go broke if that didn't happen. The college lives under necessity. Every human enterprise does. And so our material property rights are written in that fact. Paul Marino, did I thank him? He's really great, and I learn from him every time he talks. Um, he mentioned this essay by James Madison about property, and it's, the essay is about one half, about that kind of property. But then he also mentions in this essay the other kind of property we have, and this is the kind of property that makes us unique, and that is we can talk. And so already there are two things going on in this conversation. And one of the two things that's going on is, I'm telling you, if I were to talk too long today, we'd all get hungry. And I don't know whether we're going to give you lunch or not, you who are here. But the ones who are watching on TV, we're not. Kelly's saying we are going to give you guys lunch if you sit quietly. <laughs> and the ones who are watching on TV, we're not going to give you lunch. And that means I, there's a limit to what I can do. And that, that means that, you know, my wife loves to talk about how smart our dogs are in our, are in our house because they know what time 5 o'clock is. And uh, she says, yeah, they love me so much at 4.45. <laughs> you see, we're just like them. But the other thing is we can laugh at that joke. We have a critical distance from these necessities. And James Madison says in that essay that uh, Paul quoted from, he says a very beautiful thing. He says that our property also includes the things that are going on in our souls. Because remember, we could all steal stuff to get money. And uh, you know that, who's that famous guy, Willie somebody who said, why did you rob banks? And he said, because there was money in there. You know, that's, why not do that? A dog would. And if he did, it wouldn't be stealing. So something is inside us and that thing is a divine spark. And Madison recognizes that spark. You know, people think of him today that he was just interested in little property. Not at all. He actually describes the property we have in our conscience, in our opinions, in things like that, in our worship. He says, a property of a peculiar value 
he says, in the opinions we have, especially about God. And we have a right to those things, and those things are the things that are the most purely our own. You see, because he says of them in this essay, you don't need anything else to protect them. By the way, I'm going to stop and mention something. Everything I think today, that is, uh, this is true, everything I'm going to quote from today is in our Constitution reader. And that's going to be produced pretty soon for sale. And if you apply for a scholarship, we'll give you the darn thing. Because there's about 600 pages of stuff in it, and it's gorgeous. And it's the stuff on both sides. About half of the stuff in the reader is people who didn't like the Constitution of the United States, including some of those progressives that Paul Marino quoted from, and including John Calhoun and people like that who tried to... Actually, John Calhoun was a big-time unionist. He wanted the union to stay together. He just wanted slavery to be legal everywhere in it because he thought it was an abomination for people of different colors to live together as equals. And then Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, is in it saying that uh, the great scientific truth has been discovered, that slavery is right because these people are our inferiors. And the founders are in it, saying uniformly that slavery is wrong and they've got to do something about it. I'll, I'll say in a minute why that was complicated to do. And you can read all this in that reader. And this essay by Madison on property, which he wrote in 1792, it's in there. And it's about this long. It's like so much that Madison did. He had a gift that was kind of like what Lincoln had, and that was he could be a very brief and precise. He's not as poetic as Lincoln, but he's beautiful in the way he can argue. And in this essay about this long, you should get it and read it and study it carefully. You can do a Google search on the internet. Uh, just put Madison Property 1792 and you'll find it. And it's very worth reading because he says in there that in our necessitous lives, these things that we have that go on in our souls, our opinions and our things like that, that these are a remnant spared to us at the end of the day to soothe our condition. Isn't that pretty? It's like reading a good book at the end of the day. And so you've got a right to the things that you make by your own labor because your time is all you got and you're never going to get this minute that just passed back. And how you spend that time is a duty that you have for yourselves and your loved ones and your country. And that connects directly to the other thing that completes the whole dimension of the human being, and that is inside your soul, there is a critical distance from the many necessities we face, and they are our property too. Madison says, as it, as it is true that we have a right to our property, so it is also true that we have a property in our rights. Isn't that lovely? It's one of the most generous and fine things I have read anybody saying in all of life. And remember, Madison is a man who is busy founding a government. And he knows a lot of history, and so he knows that it stands to reason that he's likely to occupy some high office in that government if it's successful. And if it's not successful, he knows he's very likely to be killed. His friend Thomas Jefferson, he didn't sign the Declaration of Independence. Madison didn't. His friend Thomas Jefferson wrote the words. And in support of this declaration, we mutually pledged to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And there was a warrant out for the arrest of every one of those guys. And that warrant was issued not by a court, but by the king directly. And it didn't go to a police officer, it went to General Gage. And the order said, go find those guys and round them up. And even if it means a general war, find them and suppress them. That had been in existence for a year when they wrote those words in the Declaration of Independence. And so the stakes were big, and that meant that they were risking their lives. And so why should they not have the reward that goes with that? And that is, if we win, if we lose, we're, good, we're dead. If we win, heck, we get to be the president or the king. Why would we, in preparation for that, and this is in 1792, after the founders have completed the Constitution even, we have our republic now. Why should they be writing all these things about the rights of the citizens and the restraints on the government and compare that kind of writing 
to the kind of writing that goes on today, some of which Paul Marino cited. And isn't it true, it's easy to see, isn't it, that people in power, in government, argue commonly that the government should have more power. Wonder of wonders that that would happen. What's more remarkable is that this other thing happened. Why did that happen? By people who believe very much in a very strong government. And you see, when they argue that this material property to which we have a right connects to the more sacred, he, Madison says, kind of property that is more fully our own, he says. I've been reading a uh, biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You should uh, read it, it's really good. Metaxas is the author. And uh, Bonhoeffer was, you know, he was dead by the time he was 40, I think. And I'm at the place now where he's in prison and it's about to turn bad for him. And the Gestapo's got him, right? And he's part of the plot to kill Hitler. Good for him. And the uh, plot didn't succeed. So Hitler did it. But uh, in prison, what he's got is his thoughts and his prayers. And he was such a powerful man because he perfected the use of those to a very unusual spot, and so he stayed pretty happy. And he was an encouragement to everyone around him. You see, even that fierce and terrible regime could not rest out of our souls, out of his soul, that thing that he owned that made him a human being. Go read uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. We should put that in the Constitution Reader. It's, uh, he was a very great man. He was, it's about his life in a concentration camp. He survived it. And he was happy in the camp, kind of. Miserable and happy. Because the most important thing about him couldn't be taken from him. And the physical things we have, those things are the guardians that we erect of our souls and our consciences, just like our body is the guardian of those things. And the point is, the author of the Constitution of the United States, the chief author, knew that and put that in beautiful language and set up a government, he said, to protect the combination of those things. And our government has done that more than any government ever did it. Now I'll mention a couple of great pieces of legislation that have been passed pursuant to that understanding. And they too are the most generous and beautiful of pieces of legislation. And they're available to us as models right now. We could do nothing better than to emulate these two pieces of legislation. Both of them concern land. One of them is was passed in the summer of 1787 by the Congress under the Articles of Confederation. It's called the Northwest Ordinance, and what it does is, along with the Land Ordinance from two years earlier of 1785, it disposes of the land in the Northwest Territory. That's the first great piece of land that the United States owned. George Washington actually personally surveyed part of it. And it's the first place that we were gonna bring into the country after the new government was established, after we were having a free government of our own. It's about four years after the American Revolution ends. And what they d decide is, they're gonna come in as equal states, not colonies. We never had any colonies in America until a different principle came along and made Franklin, uh, Teddy Roosevelt think it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a colony, right? Because if there's no moral law, there's only interest. You could do, what, what can you not do? in such a circumstance as that. So in the Northwest Ordinance, it's organized that these, when these places get settled, they can organize a free government and they can apply and they'll come in as equal states. And in the meantime, they'll have their liberties like everybody else under the protection of the federal government. That's a little more complicated story than I just put it, but that's the rough story. And of the land they organize, that it's gonna be divided into townships each one with 36 sections, a mile on a side. And these 36 townships, sorry, these 36 sections, with one exception, will be sold into private hands to pay off the debts of the government. The point being, it's a really great thing for the public if the land gets into private hands and gets used. 
Now, the only reservation, by the way, was, uh, I, I can even show you where it is in Hillsdale, Michigan. It's about 400 yards from the campus. There's, a, there's a one section that is reserved for one public use only, and that's for education in each township to be controlled as an endowment by the states. It's, by the way, the greatest subsidy of education ever given. And remember, the rules about it in total that are ever passed, because, you know, less than a mile from here is the United States Department of Education, a fittingly ugly building. <laughs> and, uh, and the rules that they pass are so innumerable that I'm told by our attorney, whom we keep here in town to prevent the federal government from giving us any money, that I, you know, a reasonably educated man, will be unable to read because only an expert can read them. And all the rules in the Northwest Ordinance regarding education, I will now quote to you from memory. Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind schools and the means of education shall ever be encouraged. Short and pretty. Now, the land sales to pay the debt is precisely the opposite of the policy that we are pursuing today. Because it does just so happen that the president, within the last 10 days, has asked the Congress for a doubling of the budget to purchase land because every year, he says, millions of acres are being, open quote, lost to development, close quote. Now that means, by the way, it's the opposite idea, isn't it? Urgent. And so we're, gonna, we're not going to sell the money, sell the land to pay the debt. We're going to borrow money. I think you may have heard, the federal government actually has a deficit. <laughs> and uh, it, it hasn't been uh, narrowing rapidly in recent days. But the point is, they will borrow money to buy land. It is the direct opposite of the policy of the founders. And the, and the principles behind it are the direct opposite of the policy of the founders. That's the first law. The second law is like unto it, except even better. It was signed by Abraham Lincoln in 1862, and it's one of my favorite laws ever passed. It's the Homestead Act. And the Homestead Act provided that if you uh, would live on it for five years and work it, and if your name was anything up to and including Methuselah or Bartholomew, those are the, you, could, you could be anybody, you could be called anything, you could have 160 acres of ground. And they gave away 10% of the land area of the United States as existed then to people that they didn't know and who were never going to be able to vote for anybody then sitting in Congress. And about 1.6 million families got land under that thing. Now that law, it's a very long law, you know, by the standards of that day, signed by Lincoln, as I say, I counted it up this morning. Every time I count it, I get a different number because maybe there's, I'm finding edited versions of it on the internet. But the latest number I got, it's 1,370 words long. That is to say, it is the length of a long newspaper article. And it achieves the disposition of 10% of the land area of the United States as it then existed into private hands, no money coming into the federal treasury. It is a different idea about property rights that's driving that thing. And uh, I think that's a model. Because, by the way, if you have a lot of debt, there's only two ways. My father made me get an undergraduate minor in accounting. It's a, it's a very, he made me learn to type, too. My dad was a great guy. And uh, I didn't want to do either one of those things and he made me do it, and I benefit from it to this very day, both of them. But I can tell you that it's just a simple accounting fact that if you have a lot of debt, there are only two ways to pay it, apart from declaring bankruptcy, which would be complicated for the United States. Devastating for the United States and to the world and to all of us. One is you can pay it out of income, and the other is you could sell assets to pay it. 
We have assets. I don't even know what they're worth. But we're not selling them to pay debt the way we did the Revolutionary War debt. We're buying more. We're borrowing against future income to buy more assets. It, by the way, being true in our country that the overwhelming majority of it has nothing on it. And never will, by the way. I mean, unless some incredible change happens. And there's none such in sight. So isn't that interesting that they do that? But going along with that, because remember the point that Madison said that these two things are connected, these two kinds of property, and that any government that didn't protect the second kind, the holy, the sacred, the elevated kind, would be blamable even if protected the first kind. But he also says that the two things stand on exactly the same justification. And so if you're going to have your property rights, in the narrow sense, you're going to have your right to freedom of speech and worship. And those are the most sacred kinds of rights. And sure enough, today we hear it said, in the middle of a presidential campaign, that it's the purpose of the government to spread the wealth around. And there is an aforementioned uh, astonishing officer in the government today. Uh, Paul Marino named his name. His name is Cass Sunstein, and he is, I can't remember the bureaucratic name, Office of Something and Something and Something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, don't they all have the same name? <laughs> uh, he's the regulatory czar. And we have officials called czars in America now, and we popularly refer to them. And the administration, and it's not just this administration, Goodness, there was one in the Reagan administration. They don't repudiate the name. And I'm supposed to mention things we should do to get back our economic, you know, to protect them better. Well, the first thing we should do is that we should mount a national campaign to get use of, rid of the use of the term czar. This particular czardom, by the way, was created in the last few days. I, I can remember the date, because I looked it up just the other day. On December the 11th, 1980, that is, you know, so 40 days before Ronald Reagan was sworn in as president, the Congress passed and President Carter signed the Paperwork Reduction Act. And we've all heard of that, right? Because you get in an envelope every time you get something from the government, it's got an extra slip of paper in it. <laughs> and, and, you know, nobody gets the joke. <laughs> At least nobody in this town. And, and the Paperwork Reduction Act requires a bunch of things. And one of the things it requires is before you submit a form that the American people have to fill out, you have to submit a form to the Office of Management and Budget and get permission to do that first form. It's very good. This, it's not quite as good as Paul Marino's description of the commission. <laughs> I'll return to that in just a second. But it's almost as good. And, and uh, in the Paperwork Reduction Act, they created an office and Cass Sunstein occupies that office now. In other words, in an anti-bureaucratic, it was supposed to be, bureaucratic office created in the wave, coincident in time at least, with the wave that brought Ronald Reagan into power. The guy who holds the job now is called Czar, and he is a candid proponent of the idea of the allocation of rights to speak. Because you know, I'm talking, this will probably come to his notice, I hope so. Probably I'm talking to several thousand people right now if I haven't driven them off yet. And it's close enough to lunchtime that maybe someone will start leaving. That's a lot of people. And I'm a little guy from Arkansas. And I run this private college. And I'm making, you know, nasty arguments right now. I haven't said anything nasty, but these are serious things, right? Why should I be allowed to do that? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a brilliant preacher. And uh, he got good at uh, putting asides in his sermons to the Gestapo officers 
who were typically in church to hear. And uh, the Reich's church, it became. And there was a Nazi official who was appointed to watch over it to make sure that it comported in all of its operations with the public good. Madison says about the constitutional protections, what is government but the profoundest of all commentaries on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither internal nor external controls on the government would be needed. Madison also says that if the government, I'll read this bit to you. Excuse me, I'll have to find it. So I'm going to read it to you verbatim. It's pretty good. He says about, uh, in this essay on property, he says about regulation, that is not a just government, nor is property secure under it, where arbitrary restrictions, exemptions, and monopolies deny to part of its citizens that free use of their faculties. Faculties, you know, that means, it doesn't just mean, that doesn't mean your barn. That means your right to pray. That's what that means. Exemptions and monopolies about that. What did the king dislike? Why did he issue his writ against the revolutionaries? They were writing stuff he didn't like. They had to stop. And free choice of their occupations, which not only constitute their property in the general sense of the word, but are the means of acquiring property strictly so-called. So regulation can be a danger to both kinds of property, he says. And remember, he'd risk his life fighting a tyranny. He knew. Taxation. A just security of property is not afforded by that government under which unequal taxes oppress one species of property and reward another species, where arbitrary taxes invade the domestic sanctuaries of the rich and excessive taxes grind the faces of the poor. So, do you know what it requires to have representative government? Do you know what a revolutionary thing that is? We take it for granted now. Ours is the first ever in human history. Madison says that it's purely representative you can't have that unless there are two things and separate. And one of those two things is a government, and the other of those two things is a society that is big enough and vibrant enough and independent enough to be placed in control of the government. And by the miracle of representation, they write in the Federalist Papers, the rest of us are liberated from the daily cares of government to pursue our lives and take care of our families, which means to get practice at being a self-governing and free individual. But on the other hand, the government operates in control of us. And if the government becomes so large or intrusive as to upset those arrangements and the violations of property are a sign that that is happening, then of course you won't have that gift anymore and the character of everyone in the country will be affected by that, by that fact. Now I'll finish with what we do. I can do it real fast. A long time ago in Southern California, I got into a quarrel with something called the South Coast Air Quality Management District. And I discovered that uh, I, I got mad because I criticized them and they attacked me. And I thought, oh, these guys like to fight. And I don't go before them to get permits because the only thing I was releasing in the way of pollution was hot air. They didn't have the power to stop that yet, and I discovered that they had a beautiful building. It's still there. If you go look and see where the 57 and the 90 freeways come together in Southern California, you can see it. It's up on a hill. It's really gorgeous. And they got all their money from fees and fines on the regulated community. And they levied the fees and fines, and they heard all the claims, just like Paul said. They were the executive, judicial, and legislative branches all rolled into one. And that got changed because somebody made a stink about it. 
And I believe, by the way, that these arguments by James Madison are beautiful and true. And I believe that they require only to be made to be victorious. Now, I'm in the college business, and so to me, you know, if you're a carpenter, everything looks like a nail. Or if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. To me, everything looks like a teaching opportunity. <laughs> and first, you've got to learn. But then you've got to argue. Because the American Revolution is a very coherent thing. And it is the greatest thing of its kind ever to happen. And every one of us in this room and every one of us listening has enjoyed the benefits of that revolution and owes something because of it. And so we should learn to argue because the two forms of rule are before us and we're gonna pick one of them pretty soon and all we gotta do is make the right arguments and leave the rest in the hands of God. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Dr. Arn. The first question is actually from Tricia from Madison, uh, Mississippi, and she asks, can you give a definition of the pursuit of happiness and tell us what the Founding Fathers actually meant by it, and does it mean the same thing as property? Huh, that's great. So, well, I wonder who that person is. Whoever that is, you're admitted. Um, <laughs> The reason you might ask if it's the same thing as property is because uh, in the Virginia Bill of Rights, for example, passed a few days before the, uh, the Declaration of Independence, they mention property in that place where they have pursuit of happiness in the Declaration. And that gives rise sometimes to the argument that by pursuit of happiness, they mean happiness is a relative term and there is no real definition of it. And that's foolishness because, first of all, happiness occurs again in the Declaration of Independence about three lines down where it says people have the natural right to throw off an oppressive government and set up a new government, which seems to them most likely to secure their safety and happiness. So happiness is a thing you could secure. And the classical teaching, and this is very well known to the founders, and it's also their teaching, it's in that uh, quote that I used at the beginning from Washington in the first inaugural address, uh, indissoluble union between, between the virtue and happiness. Happiness is the human being doing well. And that means the human being living well, doing the right thing. Now, you can't have an entitlement to the government to that because you got to do a bunch of stuff. You know, some people, some people are miserable when they're rich and at peace and comfortable. And some people think that the greatest experience they ever went through and the thing that was the defining and elevating thing in their lives was to spend four years in a German concentration camp. Right? Point is, there are qualities of soul that are different in one person to the next, and it is our business to develop our qualities of soul as best as we can. And I'll just add one more point to that, because the constitutional scheme of America, Madison says, is devised, he says in the 49th Federalist, to place our reason in control of the government and to have our passions be controlled by it. And that is, by the way, the exact and precise classical definition of the proper ordering of the soul. And of course, if it takes time to get something done in the government, and if there's more than one step, and if we can't just act immediately, but only through representatives, and if there's two houses of Congress, and there's th three branches of government, and there's federalism, it's all kind of complicated. And it means the stuff that gets done will be, tend to be stuff that's sustained over time. In other words, more reasonable stuff and not just the flight of fancy at the moment. And so happiness requires the right to property for the reasons I've been explaining, and includes the right to property and is a more comprehensive term. I'm Brittany Baldwin and I'm from Houston, Texas. And along those lines, if we understand that um, happiness requires the right to property, um, and how do we, as a civil society, rekindle capitalism with a conscience in a postmodern culture that largely rejects morality, especially of a classical and Christian nature? 
Uh, ooh, that's good. I could, uh, if, this, if we were at Hillsdale College right now, I would actually make Brittany answer that question. <laughs> and she could. Isn't the point, though, that uh, there are two points. One is, look about you. The only trend that's bad is that things are coming to a head. You know, and that's not because of anything anybody did right now. It's just that we've been spending so much money for so long that now we're about to go broke. But the counter trends that are emerging are very good. There's a lot of people, you know, the American people have taken to the streets to demand that the government not give them so much stuff. That's pretty good. So first of all, I think there's kind of a resurgence in understanding of the importance of property rights. Now about the moral stuff, there's a lot of confusion about that because we live in the age of relativism and we live in an age shaped by those doctrines that Paul Marino described where we think that you can't know anything, that your opinions are only the product of your circumstances, right? Frank Goodnow, one of the progressives, founder of the American Political Science Association, for goodness sake, he, writes, he was a teacher all his life, and he writes once, we teachers perhaps take ourselves too seriously because, he said, what they really will come to believe is just whatever's put on them by their economic circumstances. You can't know anything, right? Well, one of the reasons why that opinion is not universally held is it's stupid. <laughs> and why is it stupid? It's stupid because if it were true, how could he know that thing he just said? What's the use in even that opinion, right? And of course, none of us can act for five minutes like we know stuff. One of Lincoln's favorite examples, Lincoln was happy, this like, well, by the way, it's a important fact in the, in the history of statesmanship that Winston Churchill loved pigs and, uh, and Abraham Lincoln constantly used them as an example. And hogs are very handy things, right? Because all of us are human in this room and all everybody watching, except maybe my dogs at home, are human. And the dogs, are, they, they're too stupid to know what I'm saying even when I'm there with them, right? But, and we all look all different, right? Everybody in the room, I can, you can't see the people in the room, but some of them are, you know, like there's women in here and they look, you know, more attractive than the men as a rule. And uh, so we're not equal, right? Somebody bring a pig in here. And then all of a sudden we all look really equal. You know, because we're not that. What's that hog doing in here? That's what the meaning of human equality means. But by the way, morality is born in that obvious ability to perceive. If, if somebody brought a pony in here, that's more plausible, and we need to get it out, right? We might put a halter on the pony or even a bit in his mouth and lead him out. And nobody would think anything about it much. But if one of these kids from Hillsdale College over there was being bad and I put a bit in her mouth, you know, first of all, Brittany's tough. She'd probably kick me. But, <laughs> but everybody would think, wait, that's wrong. What does he think she is, a horse? It's wrong to treat her like a horse. Can that knowledge ever be effaced? In the last serious letter he ever wrote in his life, uh, Thomas Jefferson says, about the Declaration of Independence, that it means that some men are not born with saddles on their backs, nor others booted and spurred to ride them by the grace of God. You see the point? Moral knowledge is complicated and difficult to get. It is not. And that means that despite the fact that there are generations of laminations upon our common sense by academic theories, Common sense has an irresistible way of breaking through. And sophisticated people like Professor Marino are capable of sophisticated defenses of common sense. And you put those two things together and you get something good. This is another question. Fred from Rialto, California asks, is economic liberty the same thing as economic security? Uh, that's good. Uh, I, can't, I keep thinking these questions are planted, but I think they're not. Um, that's Katie Batchelder and 
her parents are here. She wouldn't tell a fib in front of them. Um, it's too good a question, but here's the point. The point is, a sophisticated thing happens by Franklin Roosevelt and the Co Commonwealth Address. Did Paul talk about this? Did you, you talked about that, didn't you? Well, I'll mention it again, it's simple. What he figured out was, it's heck to overturn the American Revolution if you have to be against the Constitution and the Declaration at the same time, because one of them's pretty and one of them's awkward. The Constitution's in the way, it's very pretty if you understand it. But the Declaration of Independence is mighty beautiful. And so what Roosevelt sets out to do is to convert the Declaration and its defensive property rights into an empowerment of the government to take control of your property to make sure nobody loses his property. And the point is, that's the point of contest, right? Does it mean that? Well, first of all, the Declaration of Independence does not mean that to the people who wrote it, and that's the clearest thing in the world. Can it be made under a fair construction to mean that? Here's the reasoning points you have to go through. It would be cool, and you know, by the way, there was always welfare in, in America, always. And there should be welfare today. It should be local. Because that way it can be close to the thing that it's dealing with and it won't necessarily then have to be like this national great entitlement, which has certainly had some association in America with the decline of the family and the growth of illegitimate birth. And so local policy is better at things like that. And if you concentrate, and here's the real reasoning point, if you actually set up a government in which everyone's property in principle is at the command of the state to help whomever it wants, then limited government is gone. And the reason that's a bad thing is because the people in the government happen not to be angels any more than us outside the government. And so the best plan, because by the way, we've got a record about that plan now. There are problems with it. You know, the welfare state has not been good in all respects, right? And so another plan would be like the greatest economic improvement plan in the history of the United States, in the history of the world, and that is the Constitution of the United States. Look what happened to America in the 19th century. Did pretty good. And you know, by the way, what's happening in China? That is happening because they emulate us when they do. And it is limited only when they fail to emulate us, which in important respects they do fail. And by the way, there's a whole bunch of people, including a senior official in the Bush administration, the Secretary of Education, Margaret Spellings, who said that we had to emulate China. Well, she didn't really, she didn't, that's not fair. Let me be fair to her. She said that we have to have a national system of standards in education in order to be able to compete with China. And my response to that was, why become more like them? They're trying to become more like us. So yeah, the answer is, if economic security means that the government is the guarantor, well, after the government pays back $14 trillion, then it will be broke. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Dr. Arn, uh, Dave Hatcher from Falls Church, Virginia, and the proud parent of a Hillsdale graduate. Uh, we agree ideas have consequences. We agree that elections have consequences. Uh, as your friend Rush Limbaugh likes to say, we are in the arena for the battle of ideas. Let me ask an absurd question. How do you think is the best way to allow Hillsdale College, Grove City College, Claremont Institute, and others to turn out the thousands and thousands of economics professors to get them into the other universities and colleges in this country? Uh, well, thousands and thousands is too many, um, but, you know, because the principle is one riot, one ranger. Um, things have a magic about them. Um, you know, I, I, he mentioned the Claremont Institute, you know, and the, the guy who does constitution stuff at the Heritage Foundation across the street from where we stand. Most of the people I do, I do declare who've had a lot to say about the Constitution and recovering the founding are people who got educations together a long time ago. I'm one of them. Paul over there, his, his teacher, Herman Belts, was a friend of my teacher, Harry Jaffa, and we're both more ignorant than our teachers, but we picked up a bit. So 
the power of education is a very great power. And it was the progressives, by the way, who used it for power. That's not the deal. Like I, you know, these kids in here, the ones you've seen on TV and the, you know, those in the room can see them now. What do they like? I can tell you what they like. I work with them all the time. You can't make them into anything. What you can do is have a bunch of arguments with them and let them go through the arguments for real. That means if you want to understand what's wrong with America today, you're going to have to make a choice between Woodrow Wilson and James Madison. And you can't make that choice if you don't read both of them and read them in a fair light and understand how to make the argument for them, the ones I don't agree with, with that, as much as for the ones I do agree with. And that can be very powerful. Because, you know, what Cass Sunstein believes, everybody believes that today in the academic world. And those of us who don't believe that, we're outnumbered, but we've got a key advantage. We go around making sense all the time. <laughs> and it's possible, it's possible that that's because we run up against a lot of argument. So about that, the education business works the way it works. And you know, at Hillsdale, we've just started a graduate school and there'll be some PhDs coming out of that starting, they'll, the first ones will arrive in a year in a bit from now in the fall of 2012. And they're gonna go through a very rigorous and difficult life. And some of them aren't gonna make it. And they're not gonna just sit and listen to doctrines from us, they're gonna get educated the way we did. And they'll get good at it after they do it for about 25 years. And that'll make a difference as time goes on. But I will tell you that's one part, important part of the solution. But the second important part of the solution is anybody can think. Anybody can think and spend some time at it. You know, the people who are watching this, I, there are thousands of them, thank you. They're thinking. That's very powerful and that's happening right now, this morning. I have a question from Elliot from Hillsdale and he <laughs> asks, Dr. Arn talked about the Northwest Ordinance and the Homestead Act. These seem like government intervention in the economy. Does this mean some intervention is justified? Uh, so that's doubtless Elliot Geyser. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I have to give a private answer and then the real answer. The private answer is shut up, Elliot, and get, <laughs> get back to work. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the answer is, of course, some intervention in, in the economy is justified and necessary. The question is, what is the end and what is the scope of the intervention? And so that particular intervention, those were transfers of wealth, one of them a pure transfer of wealth from the public to the private sector. And the other was uh, a sale to, they really just transferred debts for assets is what they were doing. But both of them, and you know, the government has to tax. And see, remember about this, everybody should remember this. You know, there's two simple things. One is states don't have rights, people do. States are crucial to the defense of our rights and we need to repeal the 17th Amendment. It would be just such a good thing if we did. But the federal government is supposed to be a very powerful government and we need it to be. Because first of all, states were messing with people's rights. That's why they call the Constitutional Convention. But second, Wayne, you know why Wayne County, where the Detroit airport is close to us, is called Wayne County? Because General Mad Anthony Wayne, who was a very brave guy, was sent up there by George Washington to deal with some Indians and stuff. And what was peering at him across the river, on our side of the river, was a bunch of British troops who were operating on American soil with impunity. And we weren't strong enough to do anything about that. And that means that you know, there's just a lot of bad countries in the world and they might hurt us. And that's why if you read Article 1, Section 8, about half of the powers have to do with national defense. The others have to do with a national system of commerce. And three of them have to do with the federal government controlling the property on which it operates and stuff like that. So the point is, of course there have to be things like that, but their purpose should be a liberal society with representative government that can be strong and effective and not get out of hand. That's what you gotta be after. 
And those things, by the way, those two things were, because another thing is, you know, education is very important. Every American founder that I can think of, I, Paul will tell me if I'm wrong about this, I think every single one of them was in favor of some kind of universal education. And so was Abraham Lincoln. Everybody thinks that welfare for the very needy and people who have misfortunes is a good idea. But everybody thought stuff like that should be done locally where people can get practice at doing things like that and share in the running of the government. It's just a lot more efficient. And you know, Hillsdale College for 167 years has been, imp has been performing an important public service. The articles of the college say that that's what we do. But we don't, but that's a private organization doing that for the benefit of the public. And if you're trying to sustain a society like that, then you won't make rules at the top. Complex and remote, empowering distant officials in their countless numbers. I mean, and I mean that literally. Nobody knows how many there are. Nor can you keep count day to day. That is not the way. That is the wrong kind. The Homestead Act is the right kind. I'm Tiffany from LP. Um, John Dewey makes a distinction between formal and negative liberty and effective liberty. Um, if I have the freedom and liberty to ride a bicycle, but I don't have a bicycle, um, doesn't that make my liberty um, ineffective? And shouldn't the government give me a bicycle? <laughs> I like bicycles. Um, yeah, hey, free bicycle. Yeah, the, the point is, right, but the bicycle is not free. And see, M Madison says in that essay we've been talking about all morning, everybody should go read that thing, it's too great. He says that uh, in the larger sense, a property right is, a th is anything to which a person may attach a value and have a right leaving the like advantage to everyone else. Now, I'll tell you what that distinction does. If you pass a law that everybody gets a bicycle if they want one, all you've really done is pass a law that says that everybody's got to buy a bicycle. And that means that the people who don't want a bicycle, they've got to have one too. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt says in one of his most important speeches, that uh, a farmer should have a guaranteed minimum price for his crops. So let's say he decides to grow, that's my favorite example. Nobody else finds it funny, but I've found it funny for 20 years. Let's say he decides to grow Mexican jumping beans. I don't even know if there are such things, but, but let's say he decides to grow that and nobody wants them. They gotta buy them anyway, right? But then the next step, of course, is the farmer's gonna be told what to buy. So, Everybody can worship all at the same time. And nobody takes anything from anybody. Everybody can pray all at the same time. And nobody takes anything from anybody. Everybody can talk all at the same time. And although it's annoying, we can survive that. Right? Everybody can enjoy their property. That is to say, the things they have earned or have been given to them by their rightful owners and everybody can have all of that there is, and they don't have to take anything from anybody. But if positive rights, in the sense that Dewey means, Isaiah Berlin once made this big argument following him too, if positive rights come, then what it does is it sets up a conflict in the society, because then government is about who gets what from whom. And so the justice, and generosity and freedom of the constitutional arrangements breed harmony and peace in the society. And that principle breeds class warfare. <laughs>